It is May 1st, 1990, and here we are out in the Midwest. Joe Williams, it is good to see you again. <laughs> Lay, you know it's good to see you. Thank you. As I uh, sit out there in the audience and, uh, and sort of uh, take in by osmosis in a multi-number of ways what has matured and developed into the Joe Williams style, I wonder about the messages in music and how you think about words. Mm. Oh my gosh. Well, you're doing a, an hour, you know, and in some instances two hours. I mean, you don't have a chance to really think about uh, everything that is being said in them. I just choose my tunes because I like them. The songs that I like, I sing. And if someone reads something into it, then it's to their own depth and perception as opposed to anything intended by me. Because I think everybody has a different receiver. Yeah. Well, certainly in the past, there have been influences of all kinds. And, and you're carrying on the tradition of everyone from Memphis Slim, Joe Turner, Jimmy Rushing, and that uh, very distinguishable style that's yours. Well, the, they're all the forerunners, you know, people that went before us. And, and uh, they didn't, they had no special design or anything. They just did what they felt like doing as well. You know, just sang songs for the joy of singing. And you can hear it in the music. There's a joy and an exuberance that comes from their work the people you just mentioned. And that, that's all there is to it. it. It has nothing to do with a message or any of that. Just wow, Just uh, this was given to me to do and you do it. Mm. On another tack, um, Joe, uh, what are some of the marks and the turning points in your career over the years when you think about it? Turning points? Oh gosh, let's see, birthdays and uh, things like that, they're all turning points. You get older and you, I think you learn to conserve yourself as you get older uh, and you store up energy for uh, important occasions like on stage and what have you. I don't come to this to the stage exhausted. I used to. I have done it in the past. You know, when I arrived on stage, I was really spent and wasted. But I don't do that anymore, ever. You know, I go on stage and then go get wasted. <laughs> what really changed the uh, process? Age. <laughs> Looking back in time and considering age and decades, uh, if I mention the name Jimmy Noon, what do you say? Oh, gosh, that was back in 1937. That's what I say. And uh, it's a memory now. We did all popular songs. We didn't, I think the closest thing we did to what, who, this is a, uh, a black person singing with this band was five courses of back in that second where the people, women chew the back and the, no, where the men chew the back and the women do the wacky woo. That was every Saturday night we'd do that. Five courses of scat, you know, as they say. But uh, other than that, it might have been any orchestra in the land that was playing in a nightclub and broadcasting coast to coast on WBBM. Well, certainly that clarinet of Jimmy Noon's had a special kind of signature. Oh, of course it did, just as um, Benny Goodman's. Benny Goodman used to study and listen to Jimmy Noon. They brought him when he was still a student in high school in uh, Chicago, Illinois, to listen to Jimmy Noon's clarinet playing night after night. Another, uh, another milestone, perhaps, um, does Christmas Day, December 1954, have any significance for you? Yes. I caught an airplane <laughs> um, 
at uh, from Midway and flew to LaGuardia and joined the Basie Band. And the day after Christmas, uh, we left and did our first engagement at the uh, the air station down near Norfolk, uh, the uh, the base down there. And uh, then we uh, made a tour of the South and. Uh, Finished there in, uh, in Washington, D.C., the Howard Theater, and came into New York City. And then we did a tour with what a group called Birdland Stars in 1955. Sarah Vaughn, uh, Lester Young, um, golly, Stan Getz, Errol Garner, and uh, Bud Powell. Count Basie Orchestra, and I forgot who else, but boy, what a group of people, a group of stars. And we traveled together and worked together for about uh, two weeks, doing one-nighters in these big places, including the Chicago Civic Opera House and what have you. We didn't come to Minneapolis. You know. Then uh, 19, uh, the next year we did it again at Birdland Stars in 1956 and Birdland Stars in 1957. And th those were those were really high points. We added Billy Eckstein. Sarah Vaughan was on each one of those with us, though. And it was a matter of riding the bus together. And I remember Sarah and I sleeping in the dressing room together, waiting for the group to get there, you know, lying on the makeup table, sound asleep, waiting for everybody to get to the job. Wonderful traveling conditions. Oh, yes, sure. Marvelous. Ooh. <laughs> With the passing of Sarah, we've lost one of the treasures. Uh, just uh, your observations of her, her whole approach to this, uh, this wonderful medium. She was the diva. She was the, the divine one um, of uh, the ladies who were doing popular work. She was the one that was closest to a classical jazz artist, I think, and uh, uh, well-deserved um, uh, being called the Divine Miss Sarah Vaughan. The things that she did, the, the song books, uh, the things that she did from the Broadway theater, and uh, the Gershwin things and all, with the symphony orchestras and all, and the strings, and. And even the little ditties that she did, those little things, you know, they were delicious things, really. Joe Williams, uh, you call Sarah Vaughan the diva. Paul Robeson, any influence as far as you're concerned? Hmm, gosh, yes. Uh, I don't think anybody approaches him, you know, and surely nobody I would would try to uh, uh, imitate him or even emulate him, for God's sakes, you know. He was one, he was in a class by himself. Good God, man was a top of his class in Rutgers in 20s, had a, a Phi Beta Kappa, um, actor, uh, an activist, you know, an outspoken, uh, outspoken man. And because he was, of course, he was crucified, practically. You know, they, but uh, he was who he was. And the things that he uh, stood for, the things that he said, I mean, uh, it seems now if, uh, if the president says them, then it's okay, you know. But I mean, uh, but how could he, he can come along and lead in the 30s, you know. Because our program at that time said we must hate these people. You know, the program said we hate these people. Anybody who said what he said was I've traveled over most of the world and any place I've been, I found that people are people. That's all he said. I heard him say it in Washington Park, you know, Paul Robeson. And uh, you can't do any more than to make your statement and then leave the stage. You make your statement, leave the stage. But that's the stage of life. And then he would sing. 
sing, 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 and sing, and sing, and sing. But the statements, the thing that he said, the things were important, really. And the words live, you know. And they obviously uh, made a deep print on your memory. Hmm. I think inherently, we, especially when you're very young, you're looking for truths uh, that you might be able to live by. I mean, for, I mean and uh, so that someone can't come and tell you something false and, and you go for it, you know. Uh, I read, oh gosh, what is it? I've forgotten, the, I've forgotten the name of the man. I read a book that was given me by a young lady up in Audrey Craft up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 40, 44, 45, something like that. And uh, uh, the thing was waiting by Burroughs. Uh, one line says, I stand amid eternal ways, and what is mine shall know my face. You know, say, I rave no more against time nor fate, for what avails this eager pace? I stand amid eternal ways, and what is mine shall know my face. The stars come nightly to the sky, the tidal wave unto the sea, not space deep nor high can keep my own away from me. Thank you, Joe Williams. Thank you, Leigh. One postscript. Your role uh, before the cameras as an actor, before the cameras as a, a film actor as well, what, Moonshine War, 1969, Cosby show, quite a span. The theater, um, a new dimension that you like, uh, the, that role. You've always been an actor to a certain extent, but uh, in a very uh, musical way. Mm. Oh, yeah. I've heard it said that a, a good actor uh, is someone who reacts. Uh, if there's something to react to, I mean, and uh, a theater is pretty much on the same premise. You have music to react to when you're doing music, but you, in a play, uh, like in Moonshine Wars with Alan Alda and uh, Patrick McGowan and Richard Widmark, you had words to react to. You had words and actions to react to. So, uh, and the same thing with The Cosby Show. You have words again and people to react to. And some very, very slick youngsters, you know, the kids, I mean, who are on the ball all the time, and they're beautiful to work with. And uh, I'm fortunate to be able to uh, to do things with people like Jimmy Noon in 1937, and now in 1990, doing things with Bill Cosby and Johnny Carson and folks like that. Joe Williams, it's a privilege to sit with you on May 1st in the year 1990 as we speed on to the 21st century. Good health to you, wonderful performances. Thanks for sharing your time. Thank you, Lee. Nice to see you.